Lord, would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we give ourselves to you this morning. Father, I pray that you would take control, O Holy Spirit, of, of my body, my mind. Lord, that you would help me to preach this message with all the fervor and zeal of my being, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. And Lord, I pray that each one this morning, on the sound of my voice, Lord, would give ear and attention, as if they knew this would be the last message that they would ever hear this side of glory. Fathers, we look into Daniel's life, and this morning, the image, the great image, the statue. Lord, help us to see application points in our own lives this morning, that our own homes, our own lives might be changed. Lord, bless your word as it goes out. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, we have been studying the book of Daniel, expository preaching, uh, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And of course, we've come to chapter 2 and we've been there for a couple of weeks. Uh, by the way, it's good to be back at Healing Springs of the day. We're preaching homecoming last Sunday at Springtown. But good to be back here at our own church this morning. King Nebuchadnezzar is troubled, he's tormented, and he's losing sleep over a disturbing what? Does anybody remember? A dream. He was having a disturbing dream. He could not sleep. And he calls upon his magicians, his sorcerers, the astrologers, the wise men to come forward and reveal this dream to him and also the interpretation. And of course, they failed as they were unable to help this troubled man. He then ordered that they all be what? Executed. Killed. That's right. I was in Walmart the other day and, and I came out to find this flyer on my windshield whenever I came down. And, uh, it's an advertisement for an Indian reader. It says, Indian reader, palm reader and advisor. And this person claims to be a religious, holy, warm healer. That's what this individual claims to be. Well, let me tell you something, folks, uh, this morning. God is not involved in witchcraft, magic, or astrology. This individual, whomever she is, is over in Denmark, but the sorcerers could not help Nebuchadnezzar, and this woman cannot help you either. She can't do it. So don't get involved in black magic. You stay away from it. Nebuchadnezzar had the best in the land, and they could not help him. Some lady in Denmark claiming to have special powers cannot help you either. You may say, Jeffrey, I have this going on or that going on. I have a very important decision to make in the near future and I don't know what to do. Who am I to go to? The, uh, let me say this. The Indian reader cannot help you. The daily horoscope cannot help you, but I know who can. He can. Amen? He can. You surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You allow the Lord to direct your steps and He promises in Isaiah 30, 21, and thy ear shall hear a word behind me saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it whenever you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. So if you need guidance this morning, if you lack wisdom today, if you have an important decision to make, then you listen for the voice of the Lord. Don't go seeking advice from any other source. They may genuinely want to help you. They may want to help you, but they cannot help you. They can't. Now back to our text for today. just wanted to mention that in case some of you have one of these on your windshield in the near future. If you want to waste some money, then you go do that. But I would seek the Lord if I were you. Now as we apply, I think we got that plot graph for just a second. We looked at this a few weeks ago as well. As I remember from 6th grade English, a plot, a storyline begins with the conflict, sort of like a roller coaster. It builds, then you reach a climax, and then that resolution sort of comes in like a roller coaster, swooping down over. Leave that up for just a second. So our conflict then, where we are at this point in the book of Daniel chapter 2 is, again, as we mentioned earlier, the king has had this disturbing dream. He has... Uh, threatened to execute all of the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and this includes 
By the way, the godly men from Jerusalem, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he's uh, threatening to kill them all. And Daniel was approached by the captains of the king, the captain of the king's army, Ariok, uh, to be slain. And Daniel asked for a little more time. And so then he and his three Hebrew buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they began to pray for the Lord to give them an answer for an answer. And so that's the conflict as it builds. And then the climax at the top there, we come to in verses 27 through 30, when Daniel is given the answer by the Lord. And then the resolution, as we'll see today, uh, the dream is then told to Nebuchadnezzar uh, by Daniel, and then God is declared as a revealer of secrets. A revealer of secrets. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 2 this morning. Daniel chapter 2 as we pick up where we left off. Now, I think I've mentioned this before. When you do expository preaching, it's not necessarily topic-based. It's Scripture by Scripture, but it's the way that we grow. It's the way that we learn the Bible. It's the way that you become a better Christian because you know more of what's going on, what happened in Daniel's life. When someone starts talking about Daniel, you'll know more than just Daniel and the lion's den. You'll know how Daniel got there to begin with. And so, anyway, chapter 2 is where we are. And we're going to sort of look over verses 31 through 49 today. We're not going to read all of the Scripture this morning, but we'll pick up around verse 31 and we'll read parts of this section as we go. And we'll finally see what in the world it is that has King Nebuchadnezzar so disturbed and terrified, sleepless at night. Daniel chapter 2, let's read verses 31 through 33 first. The Word of God says, But as for me, Skip down to 31. I'm sorry. Thou, O king, saw us, and behold, a great image. So here's what the king is disturbed about. A great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. So this disturbing dream is of a great image, a large statue. And even though Nebuchadnezzar is the mightiest king in the world, during that time having conquered every nation in his path, he is not at the center of this disturbing dream. This colossal statue is at the center of this dream. Nor is Nebuchadnezzar in control of the events that are taking place in his dream. He is only an observer of what's going on. He's observed what's going on. And perhaps it's this sense that someone or something is more powerful than he is that has created all of this anxiety and this fear causing him to want to kill and have the deaths of so many of his wise men. So this crazy statue then is tormenting the king. Notice some things about it. First in verse 31, we see that it's a great image. It's a great image. You see that? Can we go here yeah, on 31? It's a great image. It's a great image. It's huge. It's big. It's large. Also notice in verse 31 the splendor of this, whose brightness was excellent. It was tall. It was dazzling. It was shiny. It was not tarnished or dull. It was bright. This was a bright image, a bright statue that Nebuchadnezzar was dreaming about. Notice also that it was scary. In verse 31 it says, The form thereof was terrible. Its appearance was frightening. It was frightening, terrifying. And when we were trick-or-treating Friday night, uh, we were walked up to one house and, and a guy come running around from the round house with a mask on and a chainsaw and, and was and it was and Maddie started screaming. She was terrified at the sight of this guy. By the way, it was Jacob Sanders. That's who it, who it was. But, but anyway, so uh, Madeline was screaming. She was terrified. The sight of this was terrifying her. Well, the sight of this statue was scary. It was terrifying to Nebuchadnezzar. So terrifying that even though, even though he knew this is a dream, that I'm having, Nebuchadnezzar could probably tell himself, but yet, this dream is haunting him. It is spooking him even in the daytime. But then also notice about this great image, the substance of it. Look at what this thing 
was made of. It was made of gold and silver, bronze, iron, clay. So there's a lot of substance to this image that, that, that Nebuchadnezzar was dreaming about. So his dream contains this tall statue, but something else happens in his dream to this statue. In verses 34 through 35, a stone appears, the Bible says, that had not been cut out by human hands. And this stone struck the iron and clay feet of that statue and it smashed it. It smashed that statue. And then the statue, without any supporting foundation, begins to crumble and fall. And it smashes as well. And the Bible says in verse 35 that the remains of the statue were so fine that it just blew away in the wind. Now, in the next several verses, I think we've got another slide. I want us to look at Daniel then tells the king what all this meant with this statue. And I want to point it out on this way. Daniel is telling King Nebuchadnezzar of future kingdoms, future kingdoms, empires that would rule the world. And he starts with the head. And it's a head of gold. And this represents, as you see on the picture there, the Babylonian kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar and start, of course, with the Gentiles. These, by the way, as you see there, this is the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles. So it started with the head of gold. Then next came the silver. The silver was a silver chest and silver arms. And this represented the Medes and the Persian empires. And by the way, they, they were together and they come together under King Cyrus. And that's why there's two arms represented there. It was the Medes and the Persians. Darius led the Medes. And, of course, uh, Cyrus led the Persians. And they come together under Cyrus whenever Darius died. So that's the silver. Then we come to uh, the bronze. We come to the bronze. And, of course, that's the best and the thighs. And that represents the Grecian Empire. And this is under Alexander the Great. And there are movies and so forth about Alexander the Great. And he was a, quite a mighty warrior in battle. But you notice the belly is included there. The Greeks love to indulge. They love to indulge. So it's represented in the belly and the thighs with the bronze. Then we have the two legs. The iron. That is the Roman uh, Empire. And of course they had two capitals. So there's two legs. And then at the bottom we have the feet. And the feet is part, the Bible tells us, part uh, iron and part clay. And this represents a federation of nations that will finally be completed under the Antichrist one day. But notice as well that stump that comes and smashes the feet. So that is sort of the, the image, the statue. And notice as well the course of this statue is down. It begins with gold at the top, gold at the top. How I many of you, what would you rather have right now? If someone brought you a bowl, bowl full of gold, or would you rather have some clay? Which would you rather have? Gold. We'd rather have gold. So it's a downward trend. Begins with gold at the top, at the head, and then we have clay, mud, at the feet, at the bottom. And so evolution, however, tries to tell us today that uh, humans and, and that the world has mutated to become better as time goes on stronger. The Bible says no. Things are getting worse and have been getting worse for centuries. And I think the Bible is correct from what I can observe personally. At the end of the day, we see that all of man's glory is supported by mud. Standing on a foundation of world powers deteriorate, they decay, they destruct because they stand on a foundation of clay. And by the way, there is no disputing the accuracy of the Bible here. The world may not like the message contained in the Bible regarding salvation and the heavenly Father being on the throne. The world may not like that one day judgment is coming, but the world cannot refute the accuracy here. Atheists may not acknowledge God, but there is no dispute in the accuracy of the prophecy contained within our text. It's happened just as Daniel said it would. One kingdom after another coming, coming, and going. It has. These words were penned centuries before the before the establishment of some of these empires. If God did not write this holy book that I hold within my hands this morning, Daniel could not have come out of the blue with the names of these empires. He names them throughout this book. You may not like this morning that this book calls you a sinner. You may not like that you must give an account of your life before a holy God one day. You may not like that this book says that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, but it is the most antagonistic. God here cannot refute the prophecies of the Bible. They can. It's true. He's real. God is real. And if you're here today, I want you to 
know this morning that God loves you. That Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. And if you will put your life in His hands, you will see a difference. So if you're doubting the existence of God, He's real! Now, what does the stone represent then we see in this picture? The stone right there. It's a little small stone in comparison to that big statue. It's like the stone is striking the feet as we see it. Let's look at verses 44 and 45 of Daniel chapter 2. Verse 44 says, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Verse 45. For as much as thou sawest, here we're seeing what the stone represents. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Seven times in the Bible. Is Jesus Christ referred to as a stone? A stone. Stone is a symbol of strength, durability, and firmness. And the stone strikes this statue, and it all comes crashing down. You know, the stone may be small. It appears small in this picture that we were seeing just a minute ago. The stone is small when it's cut at first, when you see it. But you know, that which destroys evil is first look. And the spots. Men laugh at it and they treat it with mockery. You could picture any one of these kingdoms, they thought they were mighty in their day, perceiving themselves as being invincible, indestructible. No one would ever be able to take them down. They would probably laugh at any opposition that tried to come against their worldly power. Remember how Jesus was perceived when he was born as a little baby. There wasn't a big celebration by the world, was there? When Christ walked this earth, He was despised and rejected by the world. But what a work He has done for the human race. He was an obscure man. He was from an obscure city. The man named Jesus was laughed at. And He was small and insignificant by this world's standards. Born in the little town of Bethlehem. And spectators laughed at Him as He was beaten and hung on the cross. But I have news for Nebuchadnezzar this morning. I have news for Cyrus and Darius this morning. I have news for Alexander the Great and any other modern rulers today. Jesus Christ came and He conquered not just some stretch of land. Jesus Christ came and conquered not just some desert terrain. Jesus Christ came and He conquered sin. He conquered death on the cross of Calvary. Then He arose again the third day. Amen, He did. So, He conquered the great. His kingdom is forever. Never can I put that picture back up real quick, Jason? Please, sir. See, as we look at this picture here, Nebuchadnezzar can't say that. The Babylonian Empire. <laughs> Cyrus can't say that. The Persian Empire. It ain't. Alexander the Great cannot say that. The Grecian Empire. It ain't. The Roman Empire. It ain't. And of course, the Antichrist, his rule, will end as well. Their kingdoms all came and their rule ended. But just as the stone and Daniel's prophecy smashed, Jesus Christ will come as the lion of the tribe of Judah, smashing earthly kingdoms, smashing Satan and evil, will be destroyed forever. And then in verses 46 through 49, with the dream and its interpretation now revealed, the king seeks to worship Daniel, but Daniel honors God. Daniel didn't take the praise. He pointed to God. Sometimes if you're watching a football game, you'll see some player say a receiver catch some pass and run into the end zone and, and they'll sort of showboat a little bit and dance a little bit, sort of draw attention to themselves as though they did something. However, how refreshing it is to see a football player make a great play, point to the skies, giving God the glory. See, Daniel does that here. It's all you, Lord, you did. Nebuchadnezzar declares your God is a God of God. It's a Lord of kings, a revealer, a 
the secrets. Now, Nebuchadnezzar still doesn't get it, so I don't want y'all to think. Notice he says, a God of gods. Just one more God of his that he can add to his list. So Nebuchadnezzar is not a changed man. I don't want y'all to think that quite yet. But I want you to know this morning that he is a revealer of secrets. A revealer of secrets. He knew Nebuchadnezzar's mysterious dream. God also knows this morning about your secrets. He knows all about your secrets today. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. Originally, this was going to be the thrust of the whole message was going to reveal, was going to all sort of surround this idea. But I want you to know this morning, God knows every word you have spoken. God knows every deed you have done, good or bad. God knows every single thought that you've had. God knows the most innermost part of you, so He knows you better than you know yourself this morning. And so if you're involved in shameful acts in secret today, don't forget that God is a revealer of secrets. And I promise you, no, He promises you greater than me promising. He promises he says, be sure that your sin will find you out. Your sin, whatever it is, it will come to the surface. It will be revealed. So whatever you think you're doing, closet, hide, whatever you're saying on telephone, thinking no one else hears it. God hears it all. God sees it all. And you'll be just for it one day. Be sure your sin will find you out. He's a revealer of secrets. So live in a way that honors God. Live in a way that honors God. If you're involved in something this morning that as a Christian, shame you. You confess it. You forsake it today. And I'm almost through. Now one other observation here in verse 49. Nebuchadnezzar rewards them for giving him answers. But notice that Daniel didn't forget his friends who prayed for him. Remember when Daniel had first said this, I, I, give me some time, I'll come up with an answer to your, to your dream and interpretation. And Daniel went to his three friends and they prayed. They prayed, the Bible tells us. Well, now that Daniel is getting some recognition by King Nebuchadnezzar, he's not forgetting those friends that prayed for him and prayed with him. He requested that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be promoted as well. How often do we see in life those that we know, maybe even family, some of ours. Someone succeeds in life and, and, and they're successful, and, but yet they go on and they forget those who help them get to where they are to become successful. Or they, they forget those who've been there for them all these years, those who've been there a shoulder to cry on, but then suddenly when they're advancing in life, they forget everybody else. We all know people like that. But that's not what Daniel did. He asked of the king that they be promoted as well. Now as we come to the conclusion, the invitation this morning. In chapter 2, God is letting Nebuchadnezzar know that He, God, is at work in this world. This is the Lord's world. It's not Nebuchadnezzar's. It's not Barack Obama's. It's not a Russian empire. It's not an ISIS takeover. But the earth is the Lord's, he declared. So the future this morning is in His control. Not anyone else's. The next election, the weather with the snow yesterday, the economy, your health, it's all in His control. So I'll say again, we must go to Him. Seek His kingdom. His wisdom. His righteousness. Again, Babylon didn't last. Persian rule of the world didn't last. The Grecian Empire didn't last. The Roman rule didn't last. And don't fool yourself today. The United States of America will not last either. Our country has begun a decline. If you haven't seen it, then you've got some blinders on. The only kingdom that is eternal is the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Yes. All these others, they thought they were the most powerful country in their day. And they all came to an end. They all came to an end. Only His kingdom is forever. Only His kingdom is eternal. So I wonder today, which kingdom are you living for? Which kingdom are you living for? Are you living a temporary life of pleasure and trying to build up things here? Or are you living for eternal rewards 
in heaven. One day that stone, as we read about the Daniel said, will come and smash all those earthly kingdoms. Which side will you be on in that day? See, we don't have to worry and fret about the evil access over the world. We pray. But if I'm living for Jesus, I have nothing to fear. He is far greater than any king that has ever lived or ever dreamed of being. He is. And so if I live for Him, everything's going to be okay. So I wonder this morning, I bet you, first, who are you living for? And what are you living for? Are you living for this world, some kingdom here? Or are you living to build up treasures in His kingdom, the eternal kingdom? Also, I wonder this morning, do you need direction in life? The Indian reader is not where we go for direction in life. We're to listen to His voice, to His voice. His ways are beneficial for you not only here, but His ways are good for you eternally. Eternally good for you. Are you struggling this morning with something in life? I don't know what it might be. It might be something in your marriage. Maybe something in your household. Maybe something with your body. I don't know what it might be. Something with work. Maybe you're struggling in life. Won't you bring that problem to the one true King, Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can help you. You take a moment to pray where you are during this time of response invitation. Come pray at the altar. I'll be glad to pray with you. I'll be down here. But make any decision you need to make. Listen to His voice this morning. Would you bow in prayer with me? Father in heaven.